This is the motto of the show Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman popes rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie with 50 million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today They offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the next part of the reading of the wonderful book History of the Inquisition by Philip from Limborch, written in 1692, translated into English from 1731 by Samuel Chandler. We have already seen quite a lot of this book because I wanted to, and for the most time it works for me also, to try to work every day on this book reading next to all the other things that I'm doing. This is not that I worry uh, that I want to push this book through or something, but that is that I want to really make a statement. The history of the Inquisition. To teach you about how the Inquisition was, so that you will not be caught by surprise when the Inquisition starts again. But without much more introduction, I think we should go and go back to the book reading, which I will start on this page, uh, which is page 77, in the blue highlighted color here on the last paragraph of page 77, which means that we retreat for a paragraph of two for continuity sakes. In the beginning of Queen Elizabeth's reign, in A.D. 1549, an act passed for the uniformity of common prayer and service in the Church and administration of the sacraments by which the Queen and bishops were empowered to ordain such ceremonies in worship as they should think for the honor of God and edification of his Church. This act was rigorously pressed and great severities used to such as could not comply with it. Parker, Archbishop of Canterbury, made the clergy subscribe to use the prescribed rites and habits, and cited before him many of the most famous divines who scrupled them, and would not allow and would allow none to be presented 
to livings or preferred in the church without an entire conformity. He summoned the whole body of uh, the London pastors and curates to appear before him at Lambeth and immediately suspended 30 th 37 who refused to subscribe to the unity of apparel and signified to them that within three months they should be totally deprived if they would not conform. So that many churches were shut up and though the people were ready to mutiny for want of ministers, Yet the Archbishop was deaf to all their complaints, and in his great goodness and piety was resolved they should have no sacraments or sermons without the surplice and the cap. And in order to prevent all opposition to church tyranny, the Star Chamber published a decree for sealing up the press and prohibiting any person to print or publish any book against the Queen's injunctions or against the meaning of them. This decree was signed by the bishops of Canterbury and London. Now, this was just a reputation of what we read before. And as you can see here in this little note that I took, I wanted to make a little comment here that I'm also going to do right now. We read now over the reign of Queen Elizabeth. And Queen Elizabeth was absolutely a quote-unquote protestant queen but and we're gonna make that sure while we continue reading she was not a saint no not in the biblical sense and how do i know that well because also under elizabeth there was persecution and we will read that in the coming time but we, before we read this I have prepared something else and I want to read to you um, from the Bible, from the King James Bible, of course. 1 Samuel chapter 8. And why do I want to read 1 Samuel chapter 8? Because I just said that Queen Elizabeth, although she was Protestant, she was not a saint. She was not a true biblical ruler of people because of persecution. And when I read this in this book, History of the Inquisition, the same thought came up to me that I often have. Why, O Israel, did you forsake God as your highest authority? Why, O Israel, did you fall into the apostasy and wanted to have a king like the heathens do? Well, when we go back to the Bible, into Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, we see where the Israelites, the people who should adhere to God and God only, as the first commandment is, how these people did not want God to rule them over, uh, to, to rule over them anymore by the clergy, by the priests that were ordained by God, but they really wanted to have an earthly king, like all the heathens do, like all the nations had. And the problem is, when you take the good, you also have to take the bad. When you reject God as your authority and ask for a human authority, a king of men among men, does the good weigh out the bad? I personally think that when we look back into the all of the history of the Bible that in the time when God rolled over ruled over his people things were fine but people themselves wanted a king of their own and not God and that's why I love to read to you first Samuel chapter 8 and let it sink in a little bit 
and think about what I mean by this. Forsaking God, give us a king. And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. And the sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands, and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war, and instruments of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be confectionaries, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyard and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your main servants and your godliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep, and ye shall be his servants. And he shall cry out in that day because of your king which he shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations and that our king may judge us, and go out before us, and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. What we've just read was the biblical account of the Israelites rejecting God as their righteous leader and they preferred someone out of their own ranks to be made a king. This is something that I find quite interesting and quite surprising when we consider this chapter began saying His sons walk not in his ways, but turned aside after Luke and took bribes and perverted judgment. And then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Listen closely, Behold, thou art old, but thy sons walk not in thy ways. Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So did Israel already see that the sons of Samuel did not do righteous unto the people. And what was their solution? To throw God out completely and to put 
one of their own, being made king above them. So they see the bad of sa example of the sons of Samuel, and instead of asking for new priests, more righteous priests, in their stead, they said, no, make people like this our rulers. Make people like this our king, with all consequences that we have to bear. Now, what does this have to do with the history of the Inquisition? Well, this has to do with the history of the Inquisition because we are reading here about rulers. We are reading here about kings and queens. We have been, we do, and we will in the future readings. And there has never ever been a king or a queen in this carnal world reigning completely biblically and only to the advantage of the people that he ruled or she ruled. And that is why I think this first Samuel chapter 8 had to be built in the reading of this history of the Inquisition. People were asking for their own doom. And no man no woman ever in this world reigned as righteous as God would reign. And that's the problem. I do this also to make sure to your understanding that you see that I do not sanctify, or no, no, sanctify is the wrong word, that, 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 I, that I am not in favor of any Man ruling over man. God is the ruler over man, not man ruler over man. If that man be a man or be a woman, that is of no importance. The point is that only God is fit to rule over mankind. And here in First Samuel chapter 8 we see how the Israelites forsook God. And every time we read about worldly rulers in this book or anywhere else, I want you to remember 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now we continue the reading with the first full paragraph on page 78. The rigid and fanatical zeal for habits and ceremonies caused the Puritans to separate from the established church and to hold private assemblies for worship. But the queen and her prelates soon made them feel their vengeance. Their meetings were disturbed, and those who attended them were apprehended and sent in large numbers, men and women, to Bridwell, to Bridewell for conviction. Others were cited to the spiritual courts and not discharged till after long attendance and their charges. Subscriptions to articles of faith were violently pressed upon the clergy, and about 100 of them were deprived anno 1572 for refusing to submit to them. Some were closely imprisoned and died in, go and, and, and died in jail. This is an old English word which is even pronounced as jail, G-A-O-L. So, some were closely imprisoned and died in jail through poverty and want. And that serious piety and Christian knowledge might reign ground as well as uniformity, the bishops, by order of the Queen, put down the prophesyings of the clergy in the year 1574 who were forbid to assemble, as they had done for some years, to discourse with one another upon religious subjects and sermons. And as some serious persons of the laity were used to meet on holy days, or after they had done work, to read the scriptures and to improve themselves in Christian knowledge, the parsons of the parishes were sent for and ordered to suppress them, Eleven Dutchmen, who were Anabaptists, were condemned in the consistory of St. Paul to the fire for heresy, nine of whom were banished, and two of them burned alive in Smithfield, the fires of Smithfield.
In the year 1583, Cupping and Thacker, two Puritan ministers, were hanged for non-conformity, meaning non-conformity with the Church of England. And this happened under the reign of Queen Elizabeth. You see what I meant? Why I read 1 Samuel chapter 8? It would be endless to go through all the severities that were used in this reign upon the count of religion. As the queen was of a very high and arbitrary temper, she pressed uniformity with great violence and found bishops enough, Bishop Parker, Bishop Aylmer and Bishop Whitgift, and others to justify and promote her measures who either entered their sees with persecuting principles or embraced them soon after their entrance, as best befitting the ends of their promotions. Silencings, depreviations, imprisonments, gibbets and stakes upon the account of religion were some of the powerful reasonings of those times. The bishops rioted in power and many of them abused it to the most cruel oppressions. The cries of innocent prisoners, the cries of widowed wives and starving children made absolutely no impression on their hearts. Piety and learning with them were void of merit. Refusal of subscriptions and nonconformity were crimes never to be forgiven. A particular account of these things may be seen in Mr. Neal's excellent history of the Puritans, who hath done justice to that subject. I shall only add that the court of high commission established in this reign by the instigation of Whitgift, Archbishop of Canterbury, by which the commission uh, by which the commissioners were empowered to inquire into all misdemeanors by all such ways and means as they could devise and thought necessary to examine persons up, uh, upon oath and to punish those who refused the oath by fine or imprisonment, according to their direction, was a high stretch of the prerogative, and had a very near resemblance to the courts of inquisition, and the cruelties that were practised in it, and the exorbitant fines that were levied by it in the two following reigns, made the universal abhorrence of the nation, so that it was dissolved by Parliament with a clause that no such court should be erected for the future. Now we read of King James I. King James I is the king who brought us, or by whom, we got brought the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. Does that make him a saint? How did he act in his country? And did he persecute also other people? Let's see. King James I, who was bred up in the Kirk of Scotland, which professed the faith and discipline of those called Puritans in England, and though he blessed God for honoring him to be king over such a Kirk, he sincere, uh, the sincerest Kirk in the world, yet, upon his accession to the English throne, soon showed his aversion to the constitution of that Kirk, and to their brethren, the Puritans in England. The Puritans were fleeing largely also from England into the then New World, the today is known as the United States of America. <coughs> Puritans have always been persecuted, wherever they were. And that was no exemption here in England. These were solicitous for a further reformation in the Church which the bishop opposed, instilling this maxim to the king, quote, no bishop, no king, unquote, which as stale and false a maxim as it is, hath been lately trumped up, 
and publicly recommended in a sermon on the 30th of January. In the conference at Hampton Court, His Majesty King James I not only sided with the bishops, but assured the Puritan ministers who were sent for to it that, quote, he had not called the assembly together for any innovations, for that he acknowledged the government ecclesiastical as it then was, to have been approved by God himself, giving them to understand that if they did not confirm, he would either hurry them out of the kingdom or else do worse. Unquote. And these reasonings of the king were so strong that Whitgift, Archbishop of Canterbury, with an impious and forded flattery, said, quote, He was verily persuaded that the king spoke by the Spirit of God. Unquote. Twas no wonder that the bishops thus supported by an inspired king should get an easy victory over the Puritans, which possibly they would not <coughs> sorry, which possibly they would not have done had his majesty been absent, and the aid of his inspiration withdrawn, since the archbishop did not pretend that himself or his brethren had any share of it. But having thus gotten the victory, they strove by many methods of violence to maintain it, and used such severities towards the, common, uh, towards the non-conformists that they were forced to seek refuge in foreign countries, like the United States of America, as I already said. The truth is, this conference at Hampton Court was never intended to satisfy the Puritans, but as a blind to introduce episcopacy into Scotland and to subvert the constitution and establishment of that church. His Majesty, in one of his speeches to his Parliament, tells them that, quote, he was never violent and unreasonable in his procession of religion, in his profession of religion, unquote. I believe all mankind will now acquit him of any violent and unreasonable attachment to the Protestant religion and liberties. Yet in the same speech it may be uh, questioned whether by inspiration of the Spirit I acknowledge the Roman Church to be our mother church, although defiled with some infirmities and corruptions. And he did behave as a very dutiful son of that mother church by the many favours he showed to the papists during his reign, by his proclamations for uniformity in religion and encouraging and supporting his bishops in their persecutions of such as differed from or could not submit to them. Bancroft, promoted to the bishopric of Canterbury, was, as the historians called him, a sturdy peace a cruel and inflexible persecutor, treating the nonconformists with the greatest rigour and severity, and who, as Halen tells us, was, quote, resolved to break them <coughs> if they would not bow. <laughs> Reminds me of convert or die. Hmm? He put the canons and constitutions agreed on in 1603 uh, furiously into execution, and such as stood out against them, he either deprived or silenced them. And indeed, as the aforementioned author says, quote, who could stand against a man of such a spirit, armed with authority, having the law on his side and the king to his friend? Unquote. During his being archbishop, he deprived, he silenced, he suspended and admonished over 300 ministers. The violences he and his brethren used in the high commissioned courts rendered it a public grievance. Quote, Every man must conform to the episcopal way and quit his hold in opinion or safety. That court was the touchstone to try whether men were metal for their stamp, and if they were not lost enough to take such impressions as were put upon them, they were made malleable there, or else they could not pass current. 
This was the beginning of that mischief, which, when it came to a full ripen, uh, ripeness, made such a bloody tincture in both kingdoms as never will be go uh, uh, as never will be got out of the bishop's lawn sleeves. Unquote. But nothing displeased the sober part of the nation more than the publication of the Book of Sports, which the bishop procures from the king, and which came out with a command enjoining all ministers to read it to their parishioners and to approve of it, and those who did not were brought into the high commission, imprisoned and suspended. This book, being only a trap to catch some conscience, uh, conscientious men, that they could not otherwise, with all their cunning a snare. Quote, These and such like machinations of the bishops, says my author, to maintain their temporal greatness, ease and plenty, made the stones and the walls of their palaces and the beam and the timber afterwards cry out, molder away and come to nothing, and caused their light to go out offensive to the nostrils of the rubbish of the people. Unquote. Indeed, many of the king's bishops, such as Bancroft, Neil, and Lord, who was a rep uh, rep uh, reputed papist in Oxford, and a man of a dangerous, turbulent spirit, were fit for any work. And as they don't appear to have had any principles of real piety themselves, they were the fittest tools that could be made use of to persecute those who had. Neil, when he was bishop of Lichfield and Coventry, prosecuted one Edward Whit uh, Whiteman for broaching erroneous doctrine, and having canonically condemned him, got the king's warrant for his execution, and he was accordingly burned in Lichfield. One legate also was prosecuted and condemned for heresy by King Bishop of London, and expired in the flames of Smithfield. He denied the divinity of our Saviour, according to the Athanasian method of explaining it. But, as Fuller tells us, he was excellently skilled in scripture, and his conversation very unblameable. But as these sacrifices were unacceptable to the people, the king preferred that heretics hereafter, though condemned, should silently and privately waste themselves away in prison, rather than to amuse others with the solemnity of a, uh, of a public execution. <sighs> but as the sacrifices were unacceptable to the people, the king preferred that heretics hereafter, though condemned, should silently and privately waste themselves away in prison, rather than to amuse others with the solemnity of a public execution. Why did I read this twice now? Well, because this is exactly what happens today in the so-called secret prisons of the CIA and other intelligence agencies all over the world. These people are put into prison, probably apprehended in the middle of the night, apprehended, put into prison, and there wasted away instead of being publicly executed. You know, the people do not like public executions, except it is for a TV show like I have heard Hunger Games and these things are, and this is just a return of the bread and games of the Circus Maximus of the old pagan Roman times. But when a king or a ruler, whoever it is, wants to get rid of any opposition, the safest thing to do is fill the prisons and let them waste away in prison, rather than to amuse others with the solemnity of a public execution. I hope you see the connections that you can make even from the time here of King James I to our time that we have today in 2017 in our world. Yeah? In the reign of the royal martyr, the church was in the height of her glory and power. Though such is the fate of all human things, that she soon uh, sickened, languished and died. 
Lord carried all before him and ruled the church with a rod of iron. And though he seems to have had too much pride to submit to the Pope of Rome, he acted the part of a Pope himself, allowing himself, as Halian tells us, to be addressed under the titles of Holiness and Most Holy Father. The things are seemed principally to have had at heart, where the introducing of an arbitrary government into the state, the suppression and extirpation of nonconformity, and bringing the Church of England in rites and ceremonies to as near a resemblance as possibly he could to the Church of Rome. Understood? Shall I read it again? <laughs> This is already what has been done since the Oxford movement in 1830 in England again. Listen to it again. The things he seemed principally to have had at heart were the introducing an arbitrary government into the state, the suppression and extirpation of non-conformity and bringing the Church of England in rites and ceremonies to as near a resemblance as possible he could to the Church of Rome. Ecumenism. This is what we are reading here in the 17th century. So, this appears by his protecting Montague, Man Waring and Sipthorpe, who had infamously preached up the king's absolute power and making the two former bishops of the church, by his persecuting the Puritan ministers in the Star Chamber and High Commission Court, who, as Halen tells us, Lord used to say, were as bad as the papists, imprisoning and fining and forcing many others to take sanctuary in New England. By this uh, by this putting down and silencing all lecturers throughout several dioceses of the kingdom, by his suspending and ejecting such as refused to read the book of sports, by his forcing the French and Dutch churches to a conformity with the rites and ceremonies of the Church of England, by his obliging the Scots to receive episcopacy, a liturgy and canons, by his forming new articles and ecclesiastical constitutions for the English clergy and enjoining them a strict oath for the preventing of all innovations, by the many popish superstitions he introduced into the public worship, such as altars, tapers, candles, candlesticks, copes, hoods, images, pictures, cringes, bows, consecrations and the like, and by the lenity that was shown throughout the whole of his administration to the papists themselves, whilst many worthy and learned protestant gentlemen and divines were treated with the utmost indignity and barbarity, some of them dying in jail, and others being made to undergo the most cruel bodily punishments for daring to oppose the arbitrary and superstitious proceedings of this furious and relentless prelate. No man of compassion can read, this, uh, can read his treatment of Dr. Leighton without being shocked and moved in the same tender manner as the House of Commons were, who several times interrupted by their tears the reading of the doctor's petition which I shall have here present my reader with entire, and leave him to form what character he pleases of the man that could contrive and carry on such a scene of barbarous and execrable cruelty. To the Honourable and High Court of Parliament, the humble petition of Alexander Leighton, prisoner in the fleet, we read, humbly showeth, how your much and long distressed petitioner on the 17th of February, gone ten years, was apprehended in Blackfriars, coming from the sermon by a high commission warrant, to which no subject's body is liable, and thence, 
with a multitude of staves and bills, was dragged along and all the way reproached by the name of the Jesuit and uh, of Jesuit and traitor, till they brought him to a London house, where he was shut up and by a strong guard kept without foot without food till seven o'clock so till seven of the clock till dr lord then president of london and dr corbett then of oxford returned from fulham house with a troop attending the gaoler of newgate was sent for who came with irons and with the strong power of halberts and staves they carried your petitioner through a blind hollow way without pretense or, examin or examination and opening up a gate into the street which some say had not been opened since Queen's, Queen's Mary's days. They thrust him into a loathsome and ruinous dark hole, full of rats and mice, which had no light but a little gate, and the roof being uncovered, the snow and rain beat in upon him, having no bedding nor place to make a fire, but the ruins of an old smoky chimney, where he had neither meat nor drink, from the Tuesday at night till the Thursday at noon. In this woeful place and doleful flight they kept him close, with two doors shut upon him for the space of fifteen weeks, suffering none to come at him till at length his wife was only admitted. The fourth day after his commitment the High Commission Perseverance came under the conduct of the sheriffs of London, to your petitioner's house, and a mighty multitude with them, giving out that they came to the search of for Jesuit, that they came to search for Jesuits' bark. There, those violent fellows of prey laid violent hands upon their petitioner's distressed wife with such a barbarous inhumanity as he is ashamed to express, and, rest, and so rested every soul in his house, holding a bent pistol to a child's breast of five years old, threatening to kill him if he would not tell where the books were, though which the child was so affrighted that he never cast it. They broke open presses, chests, boxes, the boards of the house, and everything that they found in their way, though they were willing to open all. They and some of the sheriff's men spoiled, robbed, and carried away all the books and manuscripts they found, with household stuff, your petitioner's apparel, arms, and other things, so that, so that they left nothing that liked them. Notwithstanding, your petitioner's wife told the sheriffs they might come to reckon for it. They carried also a great number of diverse of your petitioner's books and other things from one Mr. Archer's house, as he will testify. Further, your petitioner being denied the copy of his commitment by the, gaoler, by the jailer of Newgate, his wife, with some friends, repaired the sheriff repaired to the sheriff, offering him bail, according to the statute in that behalf, which being shown by an attorney at law, the sheriff replied that he wished the laws of the land and privileges of the subject had never been named in the Parliament, and yet your petitioner, having thus suffered in body, liberty, family, estate, and house, at the end of fifteen weeks was served with a subpoena, on information laid against him by Sir Robert Heath, then His Majesty's Attorney General, whose dealing with our prisoner was full of cruelty and deceit. In the meantime it did more than appear to four physicians that poison had been given him in Newgate, for his hair and skin came off in a sickness, deadly to the eye and the height thereof. As he did lie, censure was passed against him in the star chamber, without hearing which had not been heard of, notwithstanding of a certificate from four physicians, and affidavit made by an attorney, of the, de uh, of the, des of the desperateness of the 
disease. But nothing would serve Dr. Lord but the highest censure that never was passed in, the, uh, in that court to be put upon him. And so it was to be inflicted with knife, fire and whip at and upon the pillory, with then thousand pounds fine, which some of the lords con conceived should never be inflicted. Only it was imposed as on a dying man to terrify others. But the said doctor in his com uh, in, and his combinants caused the said censure to be execu executed the 26th day of November, following with a witness, for the hangman was armed with strong drink the night before, in prison and with threatening words to do it, uh, to do it cruel, cruelly. Your petitioner's hands being tied to a stake, besides all other torments, he received thirty-six stripes with the tribe court, after which he stood almost two hours on the pillory, in cold frost and snow, and suffered the rest, as cutting off the ear, firing the face, and flitting, and f uh, flitting of the nose, so that he was made a theatre of misery to men and angels. And being so broken with his sufferings that he was not able to go, the warden of the fleet would not suffer him to be carried in a coach, but he was forced to go by water, to the further endangering of his life, returning to the jail after much hard and cruel usage for the space of eight years, paying more for a chamber than the worth of it, having not a bit of bread nor drop of water allowed. The clerk of the fleet, to top up our petitioner's sufferings, sent for him to his office, and without warrant or cause given by our petitioner, set eight strong men fellowers upon him, who, who tore his cloth, bruised his body, so that, it was, so that he was never well, and carried him by head and heel to the loathsome and common jail, where, besides the filthiness of the place and vileness of the company, Diverse contrivances were laid for taking away the life of our petitioner, as shall manifestly appear if your honours will be pleased to receive and peruse a schedule, a schedule of that subject. Now the cause of all this harsh, cruel and continued ill-usage, unparalleled yet upon any of the sins Britain was blessed with Christianity, was nothing but a book written by our petitioner, called Pious Plea Against the Prelacy, and that by the call of diverse and many good Christians in the Parliament time, after diverse refusals given by our petitioner, who would not publish it being done, till it had the view and approbation of the best in the city, country and university, and some of the Parliament itself, in witness whereof he had about five hundred hands, for revealing of those names was promised more favours by Sir Robert Heath than he will speak of. But denying to turn accuser of his brethren, he was threatened with the storm which he had felt in the full, wherein, through God's mercy, he had lived, though but lived, choosing rather to lay his neck to the yoke for others than to release himself by other sufferings. Further, the petitioner was robbed of diverse goods by one Lithborn, graves and others, officers and servants of the fleet, amounting towards the value of thirty pounds, for which Lightthorn offered composition by a second hand upon the hearing of the approach of Parliament, but our petitioner notwithstanding his necessity, refused to hearken to any such illegal and dangerous way. To enumerate the rest of our petitioner's heavy pressures would take up a volume with which he will not burden your honours till further opportunity. And therefore he humbly and heartily entreated, 
that you would be graciously pleased to take this his petition into your serious thoughts and to command deliverance that he may please that he may plead his own cause or rather Christ's and the state's as also to afford such cost and damages as he has suffered in body estate and family having been prisoner and that many times in the most nasty prisons eleven years not suffered to breath in the open air to which give him leave to add this sufferings in all those particulars some sixteen years ago for publishing a book called the looking gloss of holy war further as the cause is christ's and the state's so your petitioner conceiveth under correction that the subject of the book will be the prime and main matter of your agitation, to those wisdom he hopes in the book shall approve itself. Also your petitioner's rearing age, going now in seventy-two years, together with the sickness and weakness of his long distressed wise, uh, of his long and distressed wife, required a speedy deliverance. Lastly, the sons of death. The Jesuits and Jesuited have so long insulted in their own licentious liberty and over the miseries of your servant and others who, for bearing more motives, craves pardon for this prox uh, prolixity, being necessitated thereto from the depths and lengths of his miseries, in all which he see this not to pray, and kisses your head. Wilt thou not deliver them that are drawn unto death, and that those are ready to be slain? These and the like violences of Lord, of Lord and his creatures drew down the just vengeance of the Parliament on his head, and involved the Church of England in self uh, it, and sorry, <laughs> I read the sentence again. These and the like violences of Lord and his creatures drew down the just vengeance of the Parliament on his head and involved the Church of England itself in its ruin. Bishops and common prayer were no no were now no more. The Church was formed after a quite different model and the Presbyterian discipline received and established both the Lords and Commons taking the Solemn League and Covenant, which was intended for the utter abolishing pre prelectical government. The writers of the Church Party think this is an everlasting brand of infamy upon the Presbyterians. But how doth this throw greater infamy upon them? than the subversions of prosperity in Scotland, and the imposing canons and common prayer of that nation doth on Lord and his creatures. If the alteration of the established religion in any nation be a crime in itself, tis for, ev for in every nation, and I doubt not but the Scotch Presbyterians think that that archbishop and the prelectical party acted as unjustly, illegally, tyrannically, uh, illegally and tyrannically in introducing the English form of church government and worship into Scotland, contrary to their former settlement and the inclination of almost the whole nation as the high church party can do with respect to the Presbyterians for altering the form of inter establishment in England, and indeed the same arguments that will vindicate the alternations made in Scotland by the King and the Bishops will vindicate those made in England by the Parliament and the Presbyterians. It would have been highly honourable to the Presbyterian party had they used their power when in possession of it, with moderation and avoided all those methods of persecutions and suspensions they had themselves felt the effects of in former times. Yeah. Being persecuted yourself, and then, instead of showing mercy to others, persecute them the self, yourself in the same way that you were persecuted, does not show a sign of real intelligence and uh, does not even show a, signs, a sign of reconciliation, does it? I, I think this is a quite very important sentence here.
It would have been highly honorable to the Presbyterian party had they used their power when in possession of it with moderation and avoided all those methods of persecutions and suspensions they had themselves felt the effects of in former times. But to do them justice, they had no great inclination for moderate measures. As soon as they came into the church, all others must out must out who would not comply and submit to sequestrations and imprisonments. The solemn league and covenant was imposed and rigorously exacted of all people as they could escape the brand of penalty and malignance. Many of the episcopal clergy, both in the city and in the country, were expelled their livings, though by a generosity not afterwards imitated by them. Provision was made for the support of their wives and children. The Lord Mayor Alderman and the Common Councilmen of London presented a remonstrance to the Parliament, desiring a strict course and suppressing all private and separate congregations, that all Anabaptists, all heretics and the like, as not confirmed to the public discipline, may be declared and proceeded against that all be requested to obey the government settled or to be settled, and that none dissect dis this is a very difficult word again huh? and that none dissected to the Presbyterian government by employed in any place of public trust. An ordinance of Parliament was made by which every minister that should use the common prayer in church or family, was to forfeit five pounds for the first time, ten pounds for the second, and to suffer a year's imprisonment on the third. Also every minister for every neglect of the directory was to pay forty shillings, and for every contempt of it, by writing or preaching to forfeit, that the direction uh, at the discretion of those before the whom he was convicted, any sum not under five pounds, nor above fifty pounds. The Parliament also appointed elderships to suspend at their di uh, discretion such whom they should judge to be scandalous from the sacrament with the liberty of appeal to the classical eldership. They set up also arbitrary rules about the examination and ordination of ministers by trayers, who were also found in faith and such as usually received the sacraments. And in these things they were quickened by the Scots, who complained that reformation moved so slowly and that sects and errors increased and endeavours were used for their toleration. Great restraints also were put upon the liberty of the press, by several ordinances made that for that purpose. And to say the truth, when they once got presby uh, presbyterity established, they used the same message of suspensions, sequestrations and fines that the prelatical party had done before, though not with equal severity. And were as zealous for uniformity in their own covenant and discipline as the bishops were for Liturgy, uh, for, uh, for hierarchy, liturgy, and ceremonies. But the triumphs of the Presbytery and Covenant were but short. Upon the restoration of the, one, uh, of the royal wanderer Charles II, prelacy, uh, prelacy immediately revived and exerted itself in its primitive vigor and severity. In his majesty's first declaration to his loving subjects, he was pleased to promise a liberty to tender consciences, and that no man should be disquieted or called in question for differences of opinion in matters of religion, and that he would consent to an act of parliament for the full granting that indulgence. But other measures soon prevailed. In the second year of his restoration, the Act of Uniformity was passed, by which all ministers were to read and publicly declare unsigned assent and consent to all and everything contained in and described by the Book of Common Prayer, before the feast of St. Bartholomew, then ensuing under the penalty of immediate and absolute depri depriviation. 
the consequence of this act was that between two and three thousand excellent divines were turned out of their churches, many of them, to say the least, as eminent for learning and piety as the bishops, who were, to, uh, who were the great promoters of this barbarous act, and themselves and families, many of them, exposed to the greatest distress and poverty. This cruel injustice obliged the ejected ministers and their friends to set up separate congregations and occasioned such a division from the established church as will, I hope, ever remain to witness against the tyranny of those times and the reverend authors and promoters of that act to maintain the spirit and practice of serious religion and as a public protestation of the civil and religious liberties of mankind till time shall be no more, or till the church shall do herself the justice and honor to open wide her gates for the reception of all into her communion and ministry, one not rendered incapable of either Jesus Christ, the great shepherd and bishop of souls. But, however, measures were then soon taken to disturb their meeting. In 1664, the bill against frequenting com uh, conventicles passed, and the first offence made punishable with five pounds, or three months' imprisonment, the second offence with ten pounds, or six months' imprisonment, and the third with banishment to some of the foreign plantations. Sham plots, being fathered on the dissenters to prepare the way for, for these severities. But some of the bishops, such as Sheldon, Ward, Wren, and others, did not think these hardships enough, and therefore, notwithstanding the devastations of the plague, and though several of the ejected ministers showed their piety and courage, in staying and preaching in the city during the fury of it, the Five Mile Act was passed against them the next year, at Oxford, by which all the silenced ministers were obliged to take an oath obliged to take an oath that it was not lawful, on any pretense whatsoever, to take arms against the king or any commissioned by him, and that they would not at any time endeavour an alteration in the government of church and state. Now, why did I pause here? Because they had to take an oath, as we can read here. And what does the Bible say about taking an oath? Let your nay be nay and your yea be yea. Right? Don't swear to anything, neither in heaven nor in the earth. The Bible says take no oath. But we can see a breach of the word of the Bible, I think, in almost every word that I read here. Such who scrupled the oath were forbid to come within five miles of any city or parliament borough or of the church where they had been ministers under penalty of forty pounds or six months imprisonment, imprisonment for every offence. After these things, several attempts were set on foot for a comprehension, but rendered ineffectual by the practices of the bishops, and particularly by Ward, who was Bishop of Salisbury, who had himself taken the solemn league of covenant and covenant. But having forsaken his first principles, tis no wonder he became a bitter persecutor. In the year 1670, another severe act was passed against them, by which it was, proved, uh, by which it was provided that if any person upwards of sixteen should be present at any convicticle under colour of exercising religion in any other manner than according to the practice of the Church of England, where there were five persons or more besides those of the said household, the offenders were to pay five shillings for the first offence, then ten shillings for the second, and the preacher to forfeit twenty pounds for the first and forty pounds for the second offence. This is persecuting a so-called house church. This is persecuting what Jesus said, wherever two or three of you are gathered together in my name, and the midst that I will be. And those who knowingly suffered any such convicticles in their house, barns, yards, were to forfeit even twenty pounds. The effect of these acts was 
that great numbers of ministers and their people were laid in jails among thieves and common male factors, or malefactors, where they suffered the greatest hardships and indignities. Their effects were seized on, and themselves and families reduced to almost beggary and famine. But at length this very parliament, which had passed these severe bills against Protestant dissenters, began themselves to be awakened and justly grew jealous of their religion and liberties from the increase of popery. And therefore, to prevent all dangers which might happen from the popish recusants, they passed in 1673 the Theft, the Theft Act, which hath since been contrary to the original design of the law turned against the Protestant dissenters, and made use of to exclude them from the enjoyment of those rights and privileges which they have a natural claim to. In the year 1680 a bill passed both Houses of Parliament for exempting His Majesty's Protestant dissenting subjects from certain penalties, but when the King came to the House to pass the bills, this bill was taken from the table and never heard of more. And though this Parliament voted that the prosecution of Protestant dissenters upon the penal laws was grievous to the subject, a weakening the Protestant interest and encouragement of popery and dangerous to the peace of the kingdom, yet they underwent a fresh prosecution. Their meetings were broken up, many ministers imprisoned, and most exorbitant fines levied on them and their hearers. We will continue next time in the reading of the book History of the Inquisition. I hope you find it as interesting as I do and I apologize for here and there stumbling over a word that I've never heard or what's very hard to read. As you could see, the press is not that well in this PDF. Looking forward to receive the book that I hold it in my hands. So until next time, this was Jogler66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. Says God bless you and until next time, bye bye. <laughs>